starting point. And the premise is, if you were starting or starting over in your faith, if you were starting afresh, or you're just checking out, what's this thing called Christianity? What's it, what's it really based on? What, where would I go? And one of the things that we've uh, talked about, and this is shocking to some people, is we don't start with, the Bible says. And, and yet, obviously, the Bible is a significant part, aspect of what we do. We, we start with something that happened. It's an historical reality that Christ rose from the dead. And I'm gonna, I've addressed that before. I'll address that a little bit later on as well. So, welcome to week seven. And this week's message is about faith. I think we can all agree that faith is pretty important. Faith is extremely important in a lot of aspects of life. In fact, we, we operate in faith with a lot of different things that aren't necessarily even religious in nature. Uh, for example, the, uh, the dictionary defines faith and says it has two basic meanings. One is secular, the other is religious. And the secular uh, definition is this, complete confidence in a person or a plan. Complete confidence in a person or a plan or ideas. Uh, the religious definition is this, a strong belief in a supernatural power or powers that control or influence human destiny. So this includes shared ideologies, values, and teachings of religious leaders. So let's think about faith for a moment, a few moments, in from purely a secular point of view. What was it again? Complete confidence in a person, uh, a plan, uh, ideologies, for instance, during World War II, perhaps you're familiar with Operation Overlord, uh, D-Day, that, that whole operation that uh, President Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and other allied leaders put together and began to disseminate amongst other allied leaders and said, let's put this plan together. We believe that this is possible. We believe that this can happen. We believe that it should happen. We believe that it, we need to make it happen to liberate France, to cause Germany to have to fight on two fronts and, and thus dilute their forces. So they put it into practice. And the more they talked about it, the more they convinced other people to come in and join in that plan. They had faith in Operation Overlord. They believed in it. Another example, on May 25th, 1961, President Kennedy stood before Congress and said these words, that the U.S., quote, should I always try to get his accent, I'm not good at accents, that the U.S. should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to earth. I'm glad he added that, return him safely to earth, part of that. And of course, you might you realize, unless you're a flat earther, that on July, what was it, July, I got it written down here, um, 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong took those first steps on the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So faith, faith. He talked about his idea, President Kennedy did. Uh, others probably talked to him about it first. They began to believe in it. They believed that it could happen and that it should happen. And thus, uh, people had faith and put it into practice. Now, faith can be directed in... Uh, in other ways as well. Faith can be directed in ways that ultimately turn out to be evil. For example, Hitler talked about his ideas. He convinced people. He made speeches. He rallied people around his ideas. And uh, he talked about the glory of the Third Reich and a world war broke out. Millions of people uh, died all because enough people in Germany had faith, believed in his ideals. And that, that, that's an example of faith, not in a religious way, but faith, confidence in uh, ideas or ideologies. They had faith, Germans did, until they didn't. So, here's some ideas. Uh, number one, faith, even in a secular context, is powerful. Faith, even in a secular context, is powerful. Uh, it, it could be argued that almost nothing great has happened in human history without faith being enacted by some people. So just believing that it can happen, whether it's world domination or conquering uh, cancer, uh, fighting disease, eliminating diseases, I mean, you just name it. Somebody has faith. They rally people around the ideas, and, and then they begin 
to work towards that. So number two, we look for evidence to support what we believe. Now, this is called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. And confirmation bias goes like this. We favor information that supports... We look for information that supports what we already believe. We look for information that supports what we already believe, and we filter out information to the contrary. For example, we could give dozens, and we're all guilty of this. Whether you realize it or not, we're all guilty of this. We could give dozens of examples. I'm just going to use one. Ever buy a white car? How many of y'all own a white car? A white car. So have you ever, have you ever looked at like this and, and drive, driven down the road and seen the, the number of white cars that are on the highway? And you've thought, there are lots of other people just like me that chose a white car. It must be the most popular color of a car on the road. That ever happened to anybody? Okay, yeah, yeah. I got sad news for you. White is not the most popular color of a car on the highway. It is second. Silver is first. Silver, I happen to have a silver car. I like it because it never looks dirty. It's just, that's just, I, just, I just love it for that reason. It never looks... You can go out and check it out. It's that anyway out there. So confirmation bias affects a lot of what we believe. We look for information that confirms what we already believe, and we filter out information that's to the contrary. For example, we don't invite an atheist to come in here and talk about the promotion of atheism, right? We're just, we just filter out that kind of information. Um, so whether you're a flat earther or a global earther, it affects our political perspectives, especially if you're a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian or whatever else, an Independent. We connect ideas with, that are consistent with what we already believe and ignore the rest. We all do that. Well, that, that's, just, that's just reality. But, and number three, belief is easy to maintain when you're in a group, a community of people with shared beliefs. And that's true no matter what it is. People that like certain hobbies get together and they, and they do their hobbies. People get together at BW3s and watch football games. And you know, when, you, when you're in a community of shared beliefs, um, it's easier to maintain your beliefs. Birds of a feather... But flock together. We, we tend to migrate towards people who have similar interests, uh, whether it's political, social, uh, economic, uh, or matters of religious faith. So all of what I've just said is true of secular and religious belief, belief on that level. Uh, people who share a common belief system flock together. Uh, they share ideas that support their common beliefs and uh, filter out ideas to the contrary. Now let's apply that secular concept of faith to religious nature. Somebody has some ideas about God, and they talk about them. They convince people that those ideas are good ideas. And if they're persuasive enough and they do it long enough, they can convince enough people, and poof, a religion is born. Maybe that explains why there are so many religions in the world. For example, uh, 1800s, Joseph Smith reportedly finds some tablets, reportedly is given some uh, spectacles that came from heaven and enabled him to interpret these tablets. And the Book of Mormon was born. And then Mormonism followed after that. Muhammad did the same thing. Starting in, uh, the, in 609, he believed that the angel Gabriel, he reported that the angel Gabriel uh, uh, started giving him revelations, and he wrote those down, and those occurred over the next 23 years. He wrote those revelations down, and the Quran was born. He propagated his ideas, shared them, enough people began to believe, and then Islam was born. We could go on and on and on in giving examples of those ideas. Uh, Islam lives on, Muhammad is dead. On one level, now follow me on this, okay? You guys are smart, so I'm trusting that you're going to stay tuned in. On one level, Jesus did the same thing. He taught, 
He preached. He reportedly did some miracles. He told fascinating stories. He put religious hypocrites in their place. Uh, He taught people to love one another. He did not favor the rich. He did not spurn the poor or the down and out or the up and out. Uh, he, He treated everybody equally, and people believed in him until he died. He believed that he was the Messiah. He told people he was the Son of God. And when he died, his faith, followers, the the faith that his followers also had died. I sincerely doubt that they would have written down what he taught and spread it to the world because Jesus, as, as Josh McDowell, I heard him first say this, is either Lord, liar, or a lunatic. And if he didn't raise from the dead, then he's a liar and a lunatic. And nobody would go about purporting the ideas, the beliefs of a liar and a lunatic unless you fit that bill. After all, birds of a feather (laughs) flock together. So nobody believed in Jesus at the time of his death. They fled. They stopped believing. They left. They felt like it was the end. Muhammad spent 23 years convincing people, and then he died. His ideas live on. He's dead. You can't trust Muhammad because he's dead. You can't trust George Washington, although you might follow the ideals of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. 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 You guys ought to try this sometime. I get roasted at home every week. So anyway, comes with the territory comes with the territory. I kind of enjoy it, so I've got to get used to it anyway. Yeah. All right. Um, where was I? You can believe in their ideals. You can believe in what they taught, the ideas of our founding fathers, but nobody goes to the tomb of, of George Washington and prays and says, oh, George, please do something for me today. George is dead. His ideas live on. Same with Thomas Jefferson. So, I hope you're staying with me. Once a founder of a movement is dead, you can no longer have faith in them. You can have faith in their ideals. You can have faith, a confidence in what they taught, what they stood for. But you can no longer have faith in them Because nobody trusts a dead man to do anything, right? You with me? You can study the writings of the founding fathers. You can get degrees from universities. You can become a judge and and interpret those laws of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. You can do the same thing within religious circles. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in religion from a Baptist college in Kentucky. I also have a Master of Pastoral Counseling from a, a, a Ashland Seminary here in Ohio. You can get a THD or a PhD in theology, and you, you, you can study the Old and the New Testaments. You can quote Martin Luther, John Calvin, and C.S. Lewis, and Andy Stanley. You can quote anybody and purport their teachings. You can argue for or against predestination. You can argue for or against uh, Calvinism and his five points. You can argue for or against all millennialism, premillennialism, postmillennialism. And some of you are going, well, these words. I didn't know he knew such things. I don't know what they mean. I just know the words. Okay, so, so, so you, you get what I'm saying. You, you, you can believe in the ideals. You can believe in the principles. You can believe in what it stands for. But if the founder is dead, you can't trust him. So I'm going to make some statements that may shock some of you at first, if I haven't already. I hope I've got your attention, uh, because we're just getting warmed up, okay? We're just getting warmed up. Uh, Stick with me, and you'll begin to see where where I'm going with this. Number one, Christianity is not based on the teachings of Jesus. It's not based on the teachings of Jesus. They are extremely important. They are super important. But faith, Christian faith, is not based on the teachings of Jesus. We'll get come back to that. Number two, Christianity is not a belief system of people who share common beliefs 
Although that's an extremely important aspect of Christianity. But that's not what it is, primarily. Christianity is not based on Jesus' death on a cross. Now, this is probably the most shocking statement I'm going to say today. Christianity is not based on Jesus' death on a cross for this reason. Thousands of people were crucified under Roman occupation. Thousands of people were crucified. Nobody's following any of those folks for good reasons. So it's not based on Jesus' death on a cross, although it's essential for our salvation. And number four, Christianity is based on what happened after Jesus died. He was raised from the dead. Now, had He not raised from the dead, His death on the cross would be insignificant. It would have been just another uh, criminal being crucified at at the hands of the Roman government. Uh, His teachings, what He taught, would have fallen by the wayside. I really believe that. There's good stuff there, even if Jesus never rose from the dead. But I, I doubt that those teachings would have been remembered for very long because he would have been a liar and a lunatic. So, let me circle back to week one. Week one is this. Now, remember, Acts chapter 17. Paul goes into the city of Athens, Greece. And on Saturday, the Sabbath day, he goes to the Jewish synagogue and he begins to reason with the Jewish uh, uh, people of Jewish faith from their Jewish scriptures, which we call, what? The Old Testament. And so he began to reason with them from Jewish scriptures, showing them uh, the the string of of, of teachings all through the Old Testament that point towards Jesus really being the Messiah and Jesus fulfilling those prophecies. Now, we've gone through that before. Uh, And and that's what he would do with people of a Jewish faith. But what did he do with people who did not have uh, what we might call a biblical background? People that did not have any connection with the Old Testament. People who'd never heard about Moses, didn't care about Moses, didn't care about these Jewish people, weren't studying their scriptures. What, what did he share with people? And that's Acts chapter 17. So he gets invited He's on, on, on Monday through Friday and probably on Sunday too. He's in the marketplace talking to uh, people that generally we would call pagans and people that did not have a belief at all, a Jewish belief, or but, but they did believe in gods. Remember, this is Athens, Greece. And, 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 and Athens, uh, Greece would have been the home of a lot of these. Remember the, the, the Olympians? How many of them can you name? I'm not talking about you know, modern-day Olympians, but the, the Greek pantheon of gods, those 12. Zeus, I won't name all of them, uh, Poseidon. Uh, Athena, Apollo, some of the more familiar ones, you know, the, the, those 12, the, the Greek pantheon of gods. And so he's walking around Athens and he's seeing all kinds of altars and images uh, to, to these different gods and who knows how many that there were. And then he sees one that says, to an unknown god. And, and he uses that because he gets invited to come to the Oropagus because in Athens, there was a bunch of philosophers that all they did, they must have been rich, I don't know, they, they, all they did is they got together and they discussed ideas, philosophies and religious ideas, and Paul came to their attention because he was talking about the resurrection from the dead. And so they invited him to come speak at the Oropagus. So he shares with them, and you can read this in Acts chapter 17, and he, he, he brings his little talk to a, a conclusion, and he says, God has appointed a day when he's going to judge the world by a man that he ordained, and he has given proof of it by raising him from the dead. And that got their attention. Some actually came to believe. Others said, we want to talk about this some more. Others scoffed. But what did he do in a a crowd where they were totally unfamiliar with anything that we would call Scripture? He went straight to the resurrection. And and that's what he did when he went from town to town. In the synagogues, he used the Jewish Scriptures. In in the marketplace, where where it was non-Jewish people, Gentiles, he he would argue from a different perspective. I don't mean argue, but you know what I mean. He would share from a uh, a different perspective, and he talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he has given proof of this. Now, Paul seemed to think that hundreds of miles away, 
from where it happened in Jerusalem, because in Jerusalem there were eyewitnesses that were still alive at that point in time, but this is hundreds of miles away where none of those eyewitnesses lived, and Paul still seemed to think that people could become convinced that Jesus raised from the dead even though they didn't live in Jerusalem and they would never have the opportunity to be an eyewitness. Isn't that amazing? Somehow, maybe it's that light. Maybe it's that light that comes on. Maybe that's what that song is, is at least partially referring to. I saw, I understood. I was thinking about a song that, uh, from the hymns. Remember hymns? They have not died. They're still around. But the, it's called, He Lives. You ask me, I want to I wanna start singing it. I'll not do that. You ask me, and even go slow. You ask me how I know that the song leader would always slow it way down. He lives with it. Josh, you need to come up here. He lives with it. How do I know he lives? He lives within my heart. That's very subjective. But there is objective truth to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as well. So, uh, I want to share with you three scriptures from Acts. They're going to come up on the screen here. Uh, you can jot them down. You can look at them. You can ignore them. I don't know. Hope you're still tuned in. Acts chapter 5, verse 14, first of all. Uh, just this mid-sentence. Nevertheless, more and more men and women, now note this phrase, believed in the Lord and were added to their number. In some circles, they would say more and more people got saved. More and more people were born again. More and more people were converted. Those are all different terms that are used in different places throughout the New Testament. More, But look at what it says. More and more people believed in the Lord. Notice what it doesn't say. We'll come back to that in a moment. Acts chapter 9, verse 24. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Believed in the Lord. And then Acts 16.31, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. You and your household. Look at that phrase, believe in the Lord Jesus. It's, they did not say, believe what He taught. Now, I'm not advocating we don't believe what He taught. So don't go there. That's an illogical conclusion. But look at what they are saying. Believe in Him. Trust in Him. Put your confidence in Him. You cannot put your confidence in a dead man because a dead man is dead and cannot do anything for you. The admonition here was believe in... Who is the Him? Believe in Jesus. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, and wonderful things will begin to happen in your life and in your family. Those events and acts took place about 20 years after Jesus died. So it's, it's not hundreds of years later or 100 years later. It's about 20 years. At that point in time, there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. In fact, Acts hadn't even been written yet because Acts was happening and then Luke was recording it. Acts is like a travel journal as he, a guy by the name of Luke, a doctor, a physician, traveled with Paul. Paul probably needed a personal physician because of an illness. At least that's what some people surmise. So he's not saying, listen to what they're saying. They're not saying, and I tell people this all the time, where, do, where should I start? I say, start, start. In the New Testament, just ignore the other 39 for a long time and start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. In fact, John's a great place to start. But there was no John. These folks that are saying this in Acts can't say, read the gospel according to John because there was no John written. Now, later on, they could say that. But at that, at that point, in fact, it was 250 to 300 years later, they could say that. But not even, even later than that, just because there was a copy of it doesn't mean people had access to it. Doesn't mean they could even read. It was explained to them. But anyway, it wasn't believe the Scriptures, it was believe Him. Why did they say that? Because He was alive. Because He rose from the dead. 
So here's what we've been saying. God did something amazing in the world for all the people of the world, and He did something that is even better than anything else in the world by raising Him from the dead. Paul was urging men and women to believe in Jesus, to trust Him, not just what He taught. That comes later. That comes next. It's important. It has an extremely important place in our lives. If you're a follower of Christ, I would admonish you to read Scripture regularly. If you're not a follower of Christ yet, I would encourage you to read Scripture regularly. Start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Ignore Genesis through Malachi for a long time. It's good stuff. It's hard stuff to wade through. You'll get confused. You'll you'll get bored reading about all the begats. You'll wonder, what in the world does that mean? And who cares who is the son of who? And who, well, why? Why does that really matter? Why am I reading this? Oh, yawn, yawn, sleep, sleep. Skip, you know, that. Just stay with the new te- what we call the New Testament for a long time. Faith. Faith has that element of not only believing in the ideas and the ideologies, confidence in a plan. It's also confidence in a person. You can't have faith in a dead man. You can't have faith in someone who's deceased. You can put your faith in someone who is alive. Now, someone here today may need to have a starting point for faith in their life. That's what we've been saying. Where would we go if we wanted a starting point for faith? Or where would we go if we needed a restart, if we needed to hit the reset button on our faith? And this is where I would encourage you to go, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Because that's what Christianity is founded upon. Wrestle with that idea. I've read some books from at least two people, um, Josh McDowell and Lee Strobel, both of whom set out to disprove Christianity and, and started studying the historical facts related to Christianity and both became convinced that Christianity was true, both gave their lives to Christ and started following Him and became uh, accomplished apologists, uh, defenders of the faith. But they set out to disprove the historical reliability of the facts surrounding Christianity. It is one of the most best attested facts in ancient history. And you can check that out. I don't usually encourage people to go very much to the Internet, but thanks to the Internet, you can check it out. You can check it out. So, um, faith, confidence, trust. So I got to thinking about why am I a follower of Christ? Because I I didn't grow up in a religious family. I was not taught to believe. I wasn't at a youth camp where they had, you know, a, a campfire and it was decision night. I never went to vacation Bible school where it was time where somebody, some of you from Granville campus will know, Pastor Gary came and gave the invitation for kids to follow Christ. Uh, I was never at a youth camp. Uh, I did go to a revival when I was 13, and I did pray some kind of prayer that didn't take. Uh, I don't know how else to say it but it didn't take. Um, so I started thinking about it. And, and, and here's the reality of it. It was because a group of people that met in a building that is mistakenly called a church, you understand that this building is not church. Uh, people are church. Uh, anyway, the gathering, church means gathering. The New Testament word means gathering, not building. So anyway, a people that met in a building that gathered together, they welcomed me into their youth group. They welcomed me into their Sunday school class. They welcomed me into their weekend services. And for a while, I was gung-ho. I prayed that prayer. I was gung-ho. And then I went to school as in my ninth grade year of high school, and I tried to kind of live that Christian life in school, and I got laughed at and made fun of and ridiculed. And I said, I literally, this is not worth it. I'm done with this. And I walked away. Guilt-free, walked away. That's why I say that prayer did not take, because it was a guilt-free walk away. I did not languish in, in shame and condemnation and guilt for the next five years. I was fine and dandy, fine as frog hair, some people would say. But somewhere along the line, 
um, I started reading the Bible. Uh, I started reading the Bible, even though I, I, I went to a, a different church, uh, depending on what season it was, softball season, basketball season. You had to attend two out of four Sundays if you wanted to play on the church team. This happened to be basketball season. So I was uh, playing basketball and attending a youth Sunday school class at, at a church. And uh, never once did they open the Bible. Did a lot of fun things. Never once did they open the Bible. Their church year must have started, came around, they elected new leaders or whatever, and a gal, her name was Carol, she probably was a wonderful lady. She came in one Sunday morning and said, I'm the new youth Sunday school teacher. We're going to start studying the Bible. And I said, sayonara, sister, I am out of here. I never went back. I do regret that, but I never went back. But at the same time, I'm at home reading the Bible. Somebody told me if you read a few chapters a night, you could read the whole thing through in a year. I think that became my goal, but I think it took me more than a year. I don't really remember, but I started reading the Bible for no religious reasons whatsoever. I just wanted to say I've read the world's best-selling book. And I read, contrary to the advice that I just gave you, I started with Genesis. And somehow I made it all the way through, but I could not really tell you anything that I'd read all through uh, I read Genesis through Malachi. I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Wasn't learning a thing. I read Acts, and then I turned to the book of Romans. Romans. A guy by the name of Paul wrote that to a church gathered in Rome, and his opening line was this, and I was reading in the Living Bible, paraphrase. It says, Dear friends in Rome, this letter is from Paul, Jesus Christ's slave. And I stopped dead in my tracks. In fact, I closed the Bible, didn't even finish the verse, and I put it down on my bedside table. I looked up at the ceiling and I said, no way am I going to be your slave. Uh-uh. I like life as it is. I am not. You, I even said, you go get somebody else. Boom. I couldn't shake it. Three days later, three days later, I quietly surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Somehow I'd come to believe that what I'd read in Scripture was true, that Christ died and rose from the dead. And I put my confidence in Him. You can't put your confidence in a dead man. You can put your confidence in a dead man's teachings, but Christianity is more than confidence in doctrine, in teaching. It's confidence that we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. You ask me how I know He lives because on that night, He came into my life. And He changed me. And it's still happening. He hasn't quit. He hasn't given up. And there's a long way to go. That's why I'm a follower of Christ. That's why I stay with this. Shortly after that, I was baptized um, because as I looked at Scripture, I realized, saw pretty claim, claim pretty clearly that followers of Christ were then baptized. In the New Testament, it was never the other way around. It was never be baptized as a baby, as an infant, or, uh, and then follow Christ. It was always follow Christ, believe in Him, and then be baptized. So as I looked at that, my dad even said, you don't need to be baptized. I had you baptized when you were a baby. I'm 18 years old. That's the first time he told me that. I thought, well, gee, thanks for telling me, Dad. I didn't even know you went to church at some point in your life. You know? And then as I looked at Scripture, I realized it wasn't be baptized and then be saved. It was be saved and then be... So I started following Christ. And some of you might want to have an adult restarting point in your life. You want to take your faith more seriously than you've ever taken it before. That's part of what this series has been all about. And part of that may be to be deciding, even if you decided as a child to follow Christ, and that was very real to you. You were handed a faith. You were told to believe. You, you believed it. You, you, you bought it hook, line, and sinker, and you still believe it's true. Uh, but maybe faith is becoming more real and vital to you today. I've known tons of people and have baptized a lot of people that wanted to be rebaptized as a restarting point of their faith in Christ. That may be true for you. We'd be glad to make that happen. 
Remember this, Christianity is not based on what Jesus did before He died or what He taught. It's based on what happened after He died. He rose from the dead. How am I doing on time? Um, Pretty good, actually. So, I've got this. How can we know anything from the past? How can we know anything from the How do you know anything about the Civil War? There's no living survivors of the Civil War. There's no eyewitnesses that you can go to, but does anybody here doubt that the Civil War happened? So why do we believe it? Because of historical records. Historical records. Right? News, news, stories, letters. Uh, Historians wrote about it. And then there's tons of stuff that you can read about it. So how do we know about anything from the past? Well, eyewitnesses perhaps, but if they've all passed on, then not. Um, We know it from historians. You know, the the Bible itself is not one historian. The New Testament, Matthew is a historian. Mark is an historian. Luke is an historian. John is an historian. Peter, where uh, Mark probably got his material from, uh, is an historian. So is James. So is Jude. Those two guys are both brothers of Jesus. Brothers of Jesus, you've heard me say this before, and I got this from Andy Stanley, and he says a lot of cool things. So here, here's what it is. He says, what would it take for you to be convinced that your brother was the Son of God? Now, if my brother died and came back to life, I still would doubt that he was the Son of God. So, What would it take? What would it take? James, Jude, neither one of them were believers, followers. They thought he was off his rocker. And then the resurrection. There's other historians. Let me just mention these. You can look these up on the internet. Josephus, a Jewish historian who died in 100 AD. And he references uh, a lot of things about Jesus Christ. He wasn't a believer, but he recorded historical uh, things from that era. So was Tacitus. Uh, Lucian of Samosota, Celsus, Pliny the Younger. There were plenty of eyewitnesses. Of course, they all died off. But there were plenty of historians that recorded it. And that's how we believe anything from the past. And Jesus had an encounter with one of his closest followers who was not there on the first night when he appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So who am I talking about? Thomas. We get the word, the phrase, doubting Thomas, because he wasn't there. And the other ten are coming to him and saying, Thomas, Thomas, we've seen him. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. And Th- what did Thomas say? No, unless I see him, unless I put my hand in his side and I, I can touch him, I will not believe. And then a few days later, Jesus appears uh, to them again. And this time Thomas is with them. And Thomas falls down on his knees and he cries out, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said this. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. So according to Jesus, even then, when it was possible to see him, many had come to believe by the reports of those who had seen him. We don't have the oral reports. We have the written reports. We have many written reports. Now, I'm going to say this, and you already know this. Believing something to be true doesn't make it true. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, believing that he did doesn't make it true. If the earth is not round, if you believe that it's flat, it doesn't make it flat just because you believe it, and it doesn't make it round unless you believe it. And I'll tell you why I believe the earth is round, because I've been 35,000 feet up in the air. I've seen curvature. It's round. Seven miles up, you can see the round. That's why I believe it. Personal experience. Not necessarily somebody else's report. Now here's the great thing about a risen Savior. He will come to you personally. And I've become convinced of this. I can't convince anybody that Christ has risen from the dead. But He can. He can. And He does. And he will. 
So, got some things for you to wrestle with. Don't have a card, but this is at the bottom of the printed bulletin. Two questions to wrestle with. Number one, what would it take to convince you that Christ rose from the dead? If you don't already believe that, what would it take to convince you to believe that Christ rose from the dead? And secondly, if you kind of believe in that and you haven't really come to trust Him yet, what would it take to convince you to trust Him and Him alone? What would it take? I'd encourage you to wrestle with those questions even if you've already come to trust in Christ. Ask yourself, why do I believe? Why do I believe what I believe? Why do I believe? So it's not a hand-me-down faith. It's not, they're not at the bottom of the bullet. Yeah, that's a fill-in-the-blank. I think it's not there. Sorry, folks, I turned this in. I pick it up after it's printed, and I don't look at it except for announcements. So it's not there. But those two questions, there you go. My bad. What would it take to convince you that Christ rose from the dead? What would it take to convince you, if you haven't already, to sincerely, with all your heart, no holds barred, to follow Jesus? Let's pray.